The Hodges School is a school of public policy. This key phrase describing our mission invites a reflection on what we actually mean by the qualifier public. One obvious answer is that we mean the political community as a whole, or those of its members that are on the receiving side of particular policies, sometimes called the target population of public policy, or the universe, uh, the universe of policy takers. Another answer might be that the public is the place where public policies originate. The setting in which problems are recognized and defined, interest values and preferences shaped, coalitions formed, and demands raised. The program of our conference is designed to focus on the latter of these two equally legitimate and suggested perspectives on the public. Rather than concentrating exclusively on how representative policy elites accomplish what they want to achieve on behalf of the citizenry, they represent, uh, we want to look at the source of problem definitions and preferred solutions as they emerge and are supposed to emerge according to, a, to democratic principles from the public sphere. To put it somewhat simplistically, we are here interested not primarily in the issue of how we get what we want, but in the logically prior issue of how political communities and their members come to want what they want. I do not have to convince an audience like this <coughs> that this is by no means a trivial question. Interests and desires are in no way natural or given, an outgrowth of social structures. They are thoroughly constructed. True, we are unsurprised if we find that farmers tend to want higher farm subsidies, retired people better pensions, and that all of us presumably prefer peace over war. But there are some well-known complications. Let me just mention a few of them. First, the phenomena of trade-offs, of conflict and of ignorance. Trade-off means that the more I get of good or service A, the less I get of uh, good or service B. Conflict means that the farmers call for subsidies and protective tariffs, taxpayers, payers and consumers prefer the opposite. And ignorance, one of the most understudied phenomena in social life, ignorance, refers to the ever more widespread phenomenon of citizens being generally at sea, lost on issues such as whether and how the government should bail out ailing banks, um, so, interests are in no way given, if we can, can well and often do, err uh, miserably in finding out what our interests are. It is not just ordinary citizens, but academic experts as well, who sometimes, and not too rarely, have to admit that they simply do not know, due to their lack of experience and valid analysis, what the most desirable course of action actually would be. The prerequisite of enlightened understanding that Robert Dahl has postulated as a feature of the practice of citizenship has become an exceedingly demanding idea. But that is clearly not all. A second set of complications that bedevils the formation of public preferences on the part of ordinary citizen, um, citizens concerns the question of whether a problem in question should at all continue to be solved through collectively binding public policy, rather than the issue in question being transferred to private market transactions on the basis of so-called consumer sovereignty. 
In the latter sense, there is a somewhat paradoxical public policy decision to end part or all public policy decision making in a particular sector of service needs, for instance, a national railway system. There are today powerful suggestions favoring, and Ben has uh, referred to that, the latter alternative of privatization and political outsourcing, as it were, driven by both governments trying to rid themselves of the responsibility and the budgetary burdens of collective provisions for collective goods, thus pushing the supply into markets, while at the same time consumers and private suppliers pull the provision of goods and services into markets, arguing, for example, that the private mode of provision will enhance investment opportunities, employment, consumers' freedom, freedom of choice, and competitive pricing. These push and pull factors to taken together have already led during recent decades, both in the United States and Europe, as you all know, to the partial or full abandonment of former public policy areas and the privatization of the provision of services such as utilities, transportation, telecommunication, health, education, the mass media, police, prison, security, and partly even military services. And I think uh, it is worthy of study, particularly the privatization of repressive uh, uh, state uh, agencies, as it is uh, going on, policing, military, uh, and what is uh, called uh, in the technical literature uh, uh, the management of marginality uh, uh, that is being uh, privatized. Now, as a rule of thumb, it can be demonstrated and has been widely documented, particularly by uh, British sociologists such as Stigmund and recently Colin Crouch that the change of the mode of supply affects the quality characteristics of services. Also, whatever the effects of economic and managerial privatization moves in terms of consumer prices, product quality and employment prospects in the respective sectors may turn out to be, the incidence itself of such effects seems certain. Moreover, these effects extend beyond prices and hence distribution and also beyond issues of quality. They further pertain to some additional aspects which I now want to address. First, the changes that result from privatization are more or less irreversible as the holders of new property rights tend to have very strong legal resources and to resist any reversals in case they are proposed and demanded in view of disappointing outcomes. Second, it becomes harder for public authorities to enforce legal as well as social norms, that is regulatory constraints and professional standards, applying to the management and operation of privatized facilities. Often the operation of services is handed over to private governments, that is largely unaccountable rule-making and uh, rule-enforcing agencies. A third effect, and the most significant in the present context of our conference, is the transformation of citizens and their role in collective decision-making on collectively relevant affairs to into private consumers whose predominant concern is with what fits my taste best and what is it that I can afford, in contrast to what is best for us as a collective body of the citizenry. Uh, Robert Reich has recently proposed a very suggestive way the uh, uh, emergence of a multiple self of consumers, investors, employees and citizens and uh, uh, as it were citizenship loses out against the majority of these three uh, uh, more dominant roles. Privatization as an economic and managerial category translates into a category of lifestyle and political culture. Mental privatization, I would call it, uh, or the reframing of public issues into issues of individual choice and consumption. In this sense, privatization becomes a detached and self-sufficient mental state that habituates people to the use of exit based on taste rather than voice based on reasons. 
together with evolving markets catering to specialized communities of lifestyle and income, it can shrink the horizon of citizens transformed into clients and blind them to the social and temporal externalities of what they are doing. Their capacity for forming judgments on public affairs is in danger of being under-challenged, my translation of unterfordert, with the uh, consequence, as we know from educational context, that abilities can easily decay in the absence of challenges to make use of them. After all, as I can afford a sophisticated air conditioning system in my living room, which provides me with a pleasant and healthy air temperature, air humidity and air pu purity, why should I worry too much about issues of climate change and public policies addressing them? As I can afford to send my kids to commercial preschool programs uh, that offer advanced pedagogical services and a broad choice of subjects to choose from, why should I worry about the issues of educational reform? And so on and so on. Uh, I mean, my extreme uh, uh, example is the private uh, uh, sh shelter for uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear uh, uh, war, as it is mandatory for a time in some parts of Switzerland. Everywhere, everywhere we are uh, offered opportunities for do-it-yourself policy that compete with seemingly and seemingly, uh, seemingly can substitute for public policies. I believe that these opportunities can account for much of the depoliticization and retreat from public affairs of the middle classes, except that this for demands for lower, lower taxes on wealth and income. The dis, this depoliticization can even amount to what I um, call mental or cognitive privatization. By this I mean the aversion to understanding, learning about and taking positions on the conditions of other people. A mental disposition to deny or ignore obligations to or interdependencies with, uh, between me and people who live far away, be it in geographic or socioeconomic terms. The secession of the successful, again Robert Wright, in striking parallel to the marginalization of those considered failures, need not just to be one in terms of physical space, as difference are being habitually responded to in terms of indifference. Things work differently, although with similar effects for the escape from political life of the less prosperous majority of the population. This has to do with the third and final set of complications. In order to become active in the public sphere at the input side of public policy, you need, roughly speaking, three kinds of subjective certainties. First, a reasonable certainty that there is some agency out there that will actually listen to what you have to say. That is, to be attentive to and be able to make a difference in response to what you have to say, even in the presence of powerful opponents to the point of view you wish to communicate. In other words, you need a measure of basic confidence in the workability and responsiveness of the, of the democratic process. Second, you need more. You, you need to be reasonably certain that your own concerns and points of view will be shared by others. Or a, relative, uh, or a relevant number of others uh, who can be persuaded to adopt your point of view and support it. This, uh, for instance, the dissemination of public opinion poll findings through the media can play a significant role in the very formation of political opinions. As citizens are informed about what everyone else thinks, there is a subtle side effect of discouraging them to adopt or maintain views that stray too far from those of the majority. It is a fact of political life in any mass democracy that strictly individual voices will rarely, if ever, be heard. They re remain noise. 
as letters to the editor, or as the Americans write, letters to the congressman. Noise can be transformed into voice only if it is heard as originating from some kind of representative collective actor, be it a civil society association, a trade union, a social union, a social movement, a local party organization, a faith-based community or whatever. And then on top of these two, a third um, threshold uh, is uh, the problem of joining such an organization or an agent of collective voice. That is a step that will only be taken by individuals who are sufficiently confident uh, in their own persuasiveness or deliberative superiority of the point of view they wish to raise and who also trust in the willingness and capacity of representative actors of associations to pre present their point of view fairly and in undistorted ways to the outside world. The transformation of the more of the mere noise caused by individual expressions of opinion and preferences into collectively articulated voice is, however, not only justified by the instrumental need to make use of an organizational amplifier as it were, it is equally justified by the consideration that opinions and preferences can be laundered, as Robert Gerdin has said, or rationalized, as Habermas has put it, through intra-organizational communicative processes that eventually in the course of deliberation, lead to the adoption of shared and reasoned positions. At any rate, the presence of these three thresholds result in powerful effects of discouraged silence and distorted communications. To put it inversely, only after these three thresholds have been passed successfully, communications concerning the design and purpose of public policies will actually make their way into the public sphere. The organizers of these conferences are convinced that these thresholds, as well as the symptoms of privatization and depoliticization that I have alluded to before, can in fact be overcome by strategic strategies to strengthen the public sphere. We have designed the conference to allow for and invite the intellectual search process for modes of strengthening the public and its links to policy elites. A public sphere as, it, as an institutional setting is, as I see it, defined by three factors, my three Fs. First, that it may not be any fences. Second, there may not be any prohibit prohibitive fees. Third, there may not be fear. The activities and communications going on are not constrained by one dominant organizational purpose or uh, mission. In this sense, neither a sports stadium, nor a hospital, nor a department store, uh, nor a railway station are genuinely public places. Maybe they can, on special occasions and by special means, transform in such. But streets, parks, centrally located urban places, uh, when barbers uh, sidewalks, uh, uh, clearly are modern equivalents of the Greek agora. Public spaces allow for, invite, and encourage both the active display and perception of difference. Difference of lifestyle, of opinion, of social and cultural background, etc. Among those who partake in public spaces. The direct visual contact with people differing from me seems important and is suggested by the space metaphor when applied to the arts, to the media, or even states and their public spheres. As one author has put it, there is no viable social contract without social contact. The perception of difference will, in turn, give rise to the deliberative dispositions of asking for reasons, giving reasons, and challenging the reasons given. 
Let me follow up these considerations by addressing the following question. What are public spaces good for? Why should it be desirable to reach for, def uh, to search for, to defend, to develop, to expand spaces, both in the literal and metaphorical sense, to which the characteristics apply that I have just mentioned? One answer might be that it is intrinsically desirable for people to live and participate in public spaces. Isn't it a positively liberating experience to move, again both physically and intellectually, in a space that is not colonized by the holders of economic or political power, nor belongs to someone's private sphere? Furthermore, such spaces might be considered intrinsically valuable as they provide the mental training ground for the competencies of and virtues of citizenship, opportunities for overcoming resentment and prejudice, of understanding difference, of learning about others, and for validating in the process, of, uh, in the process our own views, concerns, and opinions. Although I believe that all of these intrinsically valuable features of public spaces can be postulated with good reasons, I want to focus instead on the instrumental or functional role that public spaces can play in strengthening a democratic polity. What is a strong uh, democracy? Well, this is a question that has been asked in a famous book by Ben Bauer. Although there are clearly many answers to concerning the quality and the measure of quality of democracies, um, I think that uh, most of them converge on desirable features of political communication. Much of contemporary democratic theory deals with the reconstitution of the public sphere through designing and redesigning flows and modes of communication about public affairs. Governing elites must be able, and if need be, they must be forced to listen, both to non-elites and to elites outside of government. They also must be able, and if need be, they must be forced to speak in terms that enhance and broaden the understanding on the part of non-elites for the nature of collectively relevant affairs and proposed solutions. In fact, the ability to persuade non-elites through communication has become a major tool, not just of winning mandates and positions of political power, but especially of implementing policies in a process that has been termed interactive policy making or the use of social mechanism based on persuasion. Non-elites must be able to communicate among themselves, thus arriving as, at well-considered and deliberately, uh, deliberatively laundered views and demands, however conflicting they may, may remain, and communicate the results effectively into governing as well as non-governing elites. Now, literally dozens of original imaginative proposals for new communicative designs, to quote Habermas again, or a general restructuring of democratic decision-making, as other authors have put it, have been launched and experimented with by political scientists, activists, philosophers in recent years. There is a boom of such uh, applied philosophical uh, uh, designs and uh, uh, for restructuring political communication. To mention just a few, participatory budgeting, deliberation-based proceedings, the use of mini-publics, demands for targeted transparency, the systematic involvement of lay stakeholders and various strategies for devolution and decentralization aiming at empowering local units are just a few items on a long list of similar proposals. Most of them are inspired by recent research and theorizing on civil society, on citizenship, on social capital, on the third sector and similar items. 
Conversely, the practical work on and design of new patterns of democratic communication has given rise to complex and fancy theoretical innovations such as known as constructivist institutionalism or discursive institutionalism. Many of these of the best minds of policy analysis as well as practical policy making are involved in the emerging field of what might be called meta policy making. That is the designing, testing, implementing and critical assessment of institutional patterns in which the communicative process of ordinary poli policy making is uh, embedded or should be embedded uh, for normative reasons spelled out by democratic political theory. The critical insight that has triggered this wave of proposals for democratic innovation is the view that the official main roles of vertical communication between elites and non-elites, namely campaigning, voting and media consumption, are vastly inadequate mechanisms in terms of assuring a minimum of democratic accountability as well as a reasonably intelligent policy outcome. Political communication through mass media, as we know, is unilateral. Readers and viewers can't talk back. Where they actually can, as an interactive electronic media, the prevailing practice is that you talk to the likes of yourself, to whom you feel no reason to talk back. In both cases, the ever-present option of, turning out, of tuning out of exit is not exactly conducive to the formation of voice. In conclusion, I wish to highlight three features of current and often highly practical, highly applied uh, also highly local proposals to restore, develop and strengthen institutional frameworks of public space. First, the field of meta-policy making or of restructuring the communicative patterns in which normal policy making is being embedded does not operate at the level of classical meta-policy which consists in the writing, rewriting and critique of political constitutions. What we find instead in current debates on meta-policy-making -policy is the sub-constitutional pragmatic advocacy of and experimentation with new communicative practices which make use of both the av availability of new communication technologies and the rise of new issues and corresponding patterns of social and political mobilization. Second, and in contrast to earlier demands for political reform this, that started with claims about the given, the true or even the objective interests of some constituency which had to be mobilized and united in the pursuit of these common objectives or values, the new generation of political innovations that I have referred to um, put a much heavier emphasis on cognitive and epistemic rather than motivational and value-related aspects of the political, political process. At the core of these reform initiatives is the idea that delusionary and deceptive frames need to be replaced by more complex and more adequate ones, and that enlightened understanding of interdependence and the competent interpretation of issues is the key variable and precondition for finding out about shared interests and values. What is being called for is transparency, or the political equivalent of competent and reliable rating agencies, capable of public disclosure of what otherwise would remain in the rearm of clandestine practices of power holders and their dirty secrets. Thirdly, and fully in line with the cognitive emphasis and the subconstitutional mode of operation, there is a strong preparedness in these reform movements to have the deliberative stage of the policy process in which we find out about issues, interests and possible coalitions separated from, separated from actual political decision-making 
whereas the fusion of deliberation and uh, decision, the fusion of the two, is part of the essence of conventional politics, of party competition. Parties say, we, the leadership of my party, tell you what is good for all of us and through which of our policy decisions we are going to get there. However, it is only within the context of a solid public sphere that the two sides of policy, analysis and deliberation versus decision and implementation, can encounter each other and enter into productive friction. Thank you very much.